Alrighty, yo, what is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mr. DDG94 here. Back with another re reaction video today. I think it's time I start opening up y'all third eye, man. To the bullshit from my black brothers and black sisters out there. I think it's time I start waking up your third eye. I think it's time we start understanding our, our, our fellow brother, Malcolm. Now... I talked about Martin Luther King in that one prim video. Um, and I said how I would never follow the preachings of Martin Luther King because he didn't take us nowhere. I would rather follow the followings of Malcolm, my brother Malcolm X. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to a video titled, There Will Never Be Another Malcolm X. And yes, there will never be another Malcolm X. There will never be another brother like this. But without further ado, let's get right into it. This motherfucker don't never play when I press the goddamn button. The story of Malcolm X is a true American epic story filled with drama, intrigue, and triumph. Born into poverty and raised in a world of systemic racism, Malcolm X was a man who refused to accept his place in society. Facts. He rose from the depths of despair to become one of the most iconic figures in the fight for civil rights, advocating for black empowerment and challenging the status quo at every turn. His journey took him from the mean streets of Harlem to the halls of power in Washington, D.C., and his impact was felt across the nation. But Malcolm X was more than just a leader. He was a revolutionary, a religious firebrand, and a force of nature. He defied convention, inspired millions, and eventually paid the ultimate price for his conviction. And this is the shit that they don't want to teach you in the schools. They want to teach you about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Then they want to teach you about the first gay lesbian, the first gay person to do this, the first transsexual to do this. Fuck out of here. We need to learn about Martin, uh, Malcolm, Brother Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. That's what the real black history is. That's what we need to be learning. Fuck all that other shit. The other shit don't mean nothing. In this video, we'll uncover the untold stories, the hidden struggles, and the moments of triumph that defined Malcolm X's extraordinary legacy. On May 19, 1925, Malcolm X was born into a world that was hostile to his very existence. His parents, Louise Helen Little and Earl Little, were staunch advocates of black pride and self-reliance, inspired by the teachings of pan-African activist Marcus Garvey. However, their commitment to racial equality made them targets of the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. In 1926, the family was forced to flee to Milwaukee and then to Lansing, Michigan, where they continued to be harassed by the notorious Black Legion. Tragically, Malcolm X's father lost four brothers to white violence, a fact that would shape the young man's worldview for the rest of his life. When Malcolm X was six, his father died in what officials said was a streetcar accident. But Malcolm's mother, Louise, believed that the Black Legion murdered her husband. As a child, Malcolm was disturbed by rumors that white racists were responsible for his father's death. After his father's death, his mother Louise received a life insurance benefit, but the issuer refused to pay, claiming that her husband committed suicide. To make ends meet, Louise rented out part of her garden, and Malcolm and his siblings hunted game. In 1937, a man Louise was dating vanished from her life when she became pregnant with his child. A year later, she had a nervous breakdown and was committed to Kalamazoo State Hospital. The children were separated and sent to foster homes. Malcolm and his siblings secured her release 24 years later. Malcolm attended junior high school and high school in Michigan but he left high school in 1941 before graduating. He was told by a white teacher that practicing law, which was his dream at the time, was no realistic goal for a Negro. Later, Malcolm felt there was no place for a career-oriented black man in the white world, regardless of talent. Between the ages of 14 and 21, Malcolm lived with his half-sister Ella Little Collins in Roxbury, a neighborhood in Boston where many African Americans lived. During this time, he held various jobs. Later on, Malcolm moved to Harlem, New York City. In 1943, after spending some time in Flint, Michigan, he found a job on the New Haven Railroad and got involved in illegal activities, such as drug dealing, gambling, racketeering, and even robbery. 
During his time in Harlem, Malcolm made friends with John Elroy Sanford, who also worked as a dishwasher at Jimmy's Chicken Shack. Sanford dreamed of becoming a comedian, and both men were known for their reddish hair. Sanford was nicknamed Chicago Red after his hometown, and Malcolm was called Detroit Red. Sanford later became famous as comedian and actor Red Fox. During World War II, Malcolm X was summoned for military service by the draft board, but pretended to be mentally ill during his examination. He rambled and talked about wanting to go down south, organize black soldiers, steal guns, and kill crackers. As a result, he was deemed mentally unfit for service. After the war, Malcolm returned to Boston and became involved in a series of burglaries with four others, targeting wealthy white families. He was arrested in 1946 while attempting to retrieve a stolen watch from a repair shop and was sentenced to 8 to 10 years in Charlestown State Prison for larceny and breaking and entering. He was later transferred to Norfolk Prison Colony in Massachusetts. During Malcolm's imprisonment, he crossed paths with John Bembry, a fellow inmate who impressed him with his commanding use of language and self-education, earning him Malcolm's respect. Through Bembry's influence, Malcolm developed a thirst for knowledge and reading. Around this time, his siblings wrote to him about the Nation of Islam a religious movement advocating for black self-reliance and the repatriation of the African diaspora to Africa to escape white domination. Initially uninterested, Malcolm's brother Reginald urged him to stop smoking and eating pork, promising to teach him how to escape prison. After Reginald visited and explained the group's beliefs, including the notion that white people are devils, Malcolm concluded that his past relationships with white people had been marred by deceit, injustice, greed, and hatred. Previously disdainful of Christianity and known as Satan among the prison population, Malcolm became receptive to the Nation of Islam's message. Malcolm wrote to Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, in late 1948 to seek advice. Muhammad instructed him to renounce his past and pray to God, promising to avoid destructive behavior. Malcolm struggled before praying, but eventually became a member of the Nation of Islam and maintained regular correspondence with Muhammad. In 1950, the FBI opened a file on him after he wrote a letter to President Truman expressing opposition to the Korean War and identifying as a communist. Around the same time, he changed his name to Malcolm X on Muhammad's orders, which involved leaving behind his family name and adopting X until the Muslim's original name was revealed. Malcolm X believed that the X symbolized the African family name he could never know. So after being released from prison in August 1952, Malcolm X made his way to Chicago to meet with Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. From there, he was named assistant minister at the nation's temple number one in Detroit in June 1953. Later that year, he established the nation's temple number 11 in Boston and expanded temple number 12 in Philadelphia in March. Two months later, he was chosen to lead temple number seven in Harlem where he quickly increased his membership. The FBI started keeping an eye on Malcolm X in 1953, but shifted their focus from his possible communist ties to his rapid rise in the Nation of Islam. Despite their surveillance, Malcolm X continued to successfully recruit members for the Nation of Islam in 1955. He established temples in Springfield, Massachusetts, number 13, Hartford, Connecticut, number 14, and Atlanta, number 15, with hundreds of African Americans joining every month. In addition to his impressive speaking skills, Malcolm X had a striking physical presence. He was six foot three inches tall and weighed around 180 pounds. Writers have described him as powerfully built and mesmerizingly handsome, always impeccably groomed. Malcolm X came into the national spotlight in 1957 following an incident involving one of his fellow Nation of Islam members, Hinton Johnson. On April 26 of that year, Johnson and two other Nation of Islam members saw two New York City police officers beating an African-American man with nightsticks. When they tried to intervene and told the officers that they were not in Alabama but in New York, one of the officers turned on Johnson, beating him so badly that he suffered brain contusions. All four African-American American men, including Johnson, were subsequently arrested. This incident brought attention to police brutality and racism in the North and led to increased public interest in the Nation of Islam and its message. He commandeered a large protest which caused a police officer to comment to the New York Amsterdam News that no one man should have that much power. 
This led to the New York City Police Department monitoring Malcolm X within a month. The police department also contacted authorities in other cities where he had lived or served time in prison. Despite the surveillance, a grand jury did not indict the officers who beat Johnson. Malcolm X sent an angry telegram to the police commissioner in October, and the police department responded by assigning undercover officers to infiltrate the Nation of Islam. During the late 1950s, Malcolm X began to use a new name, Malcolm Shabazz or Malik El Shabazz. However, he continued to be known as Malcolm X. His views on various issues and events were frequently reported in the media, both in print and on television. He was even featured in a 1959 New York City television broadcast about the Nation of Islam called The Hate That Hate Produced. In September 1960, Malcolm X attended the United Nations General Assembly in New York City, where he was invited to the official functions of several African nations. He had the opportunity to meet with important figures such as Kamal Abdel Nassar of Egypt, Ahmed Segou Touré of Guinea, and Kenneth Kwanda of the Zambian African National Congress. During the assembly, Fidel Castro also made an appearance and Malcolm X was part of the Harlem community leaders who welcomed him publicly. Castro was impressed with Malcolm X and they even had a private meeting that lasted for two hours. By the end of their conversation, Castro invited Malcolm X to visit Cuba. Between 1965 and 1975, the Nation of Islam experienced a resurgence and Malcolm X became its most prominent leader. He held the position of minister at Temple No. 7 in Harlem and was also responsible for organizing several other temples around the country. During this time, he developed a close relationship with Elijah Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam. In 1964, Malcolm left the Nation of Islam and converted to Sunni Islam, changing his name to El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. He made a pilgrimage to Mecca and discovered that Islam was not inherently racist. He also became more politically modern distancing himself from the Nation of Islam's separatist views. Malcolm's departure from the Nation of Islam was not smooth. Elijah Muhammad became increasingly concerned about Malcolm's growing popularity and his criticism of the nation's leadership. At the same time, Malcolm began to hear rumors of Elijah Muhammad's infidelities, which caused a rift between the two men. Malcolm X played a significant role in the Nation of Islam's rise in membership during the 1950s and 1960s, with estimates ranging from 500 to 75,000 members. He was considered the group's second most influential leader after Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X influenced even extended to famous boxer Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr., who he inspired to join the nation and change his name to Muhammad Ali. The two became close, and Ali even brought Malcolm X and his family to watch him train in Miami in 1964. One night in Miami, the 2020 thought-provoking film adaptation of Kemp Power's play vividly explores the relationship between Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. After Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, he attempted to persuade Ali to convert to Sunni Islam with him. But Ali instead cut ties with him, later admitting that it was one of his greatest regrets. Malcolm X also mentored Louis X, who later became known as Louis Farrakhan, and eventually rose to lead the Nation of Islam. Additionally, he served as a mentor and confidant to Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace D. Muhammad, who expressed doubts about his father's teachings. Wallace was excommunicated from the Nation of Islam multiple times, but was eventually readmitted. Ultimately, Malcolm was silenced by the Nation of Islam and ultimately suspended from the organization. Despite this setback, Malcolm X's popularity with the media had grown significantly, and some members of the Nation of Islam felt that he posed a threat to Elijah Muhammad's authority. The interest of publishers in Malcolm X's autobiography was evidence of his appeal to the public. In 1963, Louis Lomax wrote a book about the nation titled When the Word is Given, which prominently featured a photograph of Malcolm X on the cover. Lomax also included five speeches by Malcolm X while only featuring one by Elijah Muhammad, a fact that angered and made Muhammad envious. In a public announcement on March 8, 1964, Malcolm X declared his departure from the Nation of Islam. Despite remaining a Muslim, he believed that the organization's inflexible teachings had reached their limits. He shared his plans to establish a black nationalist group with the goal of raising the political awareness of African Americans. Malcolm X also expressed his eagerness to collaborate with other civil rights leaders, a move that Elijah Muhammad had previously prevented 
prevented him from making. Malcolm X founded two organizations after leaving the Nation of Islam, the Muslim Mosque Inc., MMI, which focused on religion, and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, OAAU, a secular group that promoted Pan-Africanism. In March 1964, he had a brief encounter with Martin Luther King Jr. in Washington, D.C. During the Senate's discussion of the Civil Rights Bill, which was documented in photographs, Malcolm X delivered a speech in April called The Ballot or the Bullet, urging African Americans to exercise their right to vote wisely, but warning that violence might be necessary if the government continued to obstruct their full equality. Following his departure from the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X was introduced to the Sunni faith by several Sunni Muslims, and he soon converted. So in 1964, things got really intense for Malcolm X as he continued to have conflicts with the Nation of Islam. He received repeated threats throughout the year. In February, someone from Temple No. 7 actually bombed his car. And in March, Elijah Muhammad was recorded saying that hypocrites like Malcolm should have their heads cut off. Then in April, Muhammad Speaks published a cartoon showing Malcolm X's severed head bouncing around. The threats didn't stop there. In June, Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X's wife, received a call saying her husband was as good as dead. And just four days later, an FBI informant was tipped off that Malcolm X was going to be killed. On top of that, the nation sued to take back Malcolm X's home in East Elmhurst, and his family was ordered to leave. But the night before the hearing to postpone the eviction, the house was set on fire and destroyed. Things just kept escalating. In July, John Ali who was suspected of being an undercover FBI agent, said that anyone who opposes the Honorable Elijah Muhammad puts their life in jeopardy. And in December, Muhammad Speaks published an article saying that such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death. Despite all of this, Malcolm X continued to stand up for what he believed in. In fact, Ebony Magazine published a photo of him in September of that year, holding an M1 carbine and looking out a window as a way to show his defiance in the face of these threats. In 1965, Malcolm X stated in an interview with Gordon Parks that he believed the Nation of Islam was attempting to assassinate him. Just two days later, while preparing to speak at the Organization of Afro-American Unity in New York, chaos erupted in the audience. As Malcolm X and his bodyguards attempted to calm the situation, a man rushed forward and shot him once in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two other men charged the station and fired semi-automatic handguns. Malcolm was rushed to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, but died at 3.30 p.m. the same day. The autopsy revealed that he had suffered 21 gunshot wounds, including 10 from the initial shotgun blast. One of the gunmen, Talmadge Hare, also known as Thomas Hagen, was beaten by the crowd before police arrived. The other two gunmen were identified as Nation of Islam members Norman 3X Butler and Thomas 15X Johnson. All three men were convicted of murder in March 1966 and sentenced to life in prison. Between February 23rd to the 26th, Unity Funeral Home in Harlem hosted a public viewing for Malcolm X, which drew a staggering 14,000 to 30,000 mourners. On February 27th, the day of his funeral, loudspeakers were set up outside Harlem's Faith Temple of the Church of of God in Christ to accommodate the overflow crowd while a local TV station aired the service live. Civil rights leaders like John Lewis, Bayard Rustin, James Foreman, James Farmer, Jesse Gray, and Andrew Young attended the funeral. Actor and activist Ozzie Davis delivered a moving eulogy in which he referred to Malcolm X as our shining black prince who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us so. Malcolm X was laid to rest at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. In a touching gesture, his friends took up the shovels of the gravediggers to finish the burial themselves. He will forever be known as one of the greatest leaders in history. If you enjoyed this documentary, then you will love the video on the screen. It's another incredible story that will change your perspective on life. Click on it now to watch. We'll see you over there. Alrighty, that's just going to about do it for this one, man. Michael Max was the truth, man. I'm going to get some, I'm going to gather up some more clips, man. So that way y'all can understand why this man... This man is so pro prolific and so powerful, bro. His words are just so, and his thoughts and how he, he kind of predicted how this shit was going to go. You know what I'm saying? He kind of predicted how the world was going to go if we went down certain routes. And we went down those routes. And he predicted that that was going to be our downfall. So, yeah, man, I'm going to find clips. And I'm going to get them up for y'all. But until then, peace out.